What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Psychology of Spirituality. Today, we spoke with Dr. Harvey Aronson, who is a psychotherapist. He's been practicing for 30 years. He's also a Tibetan Buddhist. He helped co-find the Dawn Meditation, Dawn Mountain Meditation Center in Houston. He's also an author of a book entitled Buddhist Practices, Reconciling Eastern Ideals with Western Psychology, which I have put in the description below. It's available on Amazon Kindle. Uh, many of the things he speaks about can be found in this book, which I'm, I've purchased and I'm going to read um, very soon. Before we get into the conversation, I wanted to touch a bit on some of the things he speaks about, um, and that's differentiating between Tibetan Buddhism and Theravada Buddhism. So just, let's just do a one minute summary before we get into the conversation. Thank you guys. The emphasis for a Tibetan Buddhist is not to reach Nirvana, but to reach the state of an Arhat, which is one who takes the suffering of others and seeks to liberate them. Here, unlocking the Buddha nature is usually attained through different tantric practices. The Theravada tradition aligns itself more closely with the teachings of the original Buddha also known as Siddhartha Gautama. Here, the focus is on a personal journey to attain nirvana and break the cycle of samsara or suffering. This is a more individualized effort. There are many more differences between the two traditions as well as other Buddhist traditions, but it's important to note the commonality between the different traditions, and that is to understand the suffering that is inherent in this maze of life so that we can better love one another and break the illusion of the material world. And now on to our conversation with Dr. Aronson. Ready? You ready, Dr. Aronson? I'm ready. Hey everyone, welcome to Psychology of Spirituality. I'm very excited to have our guest, uh, Dr. Aronson, on today's episode. We're sitting here in the Dawn Meditation Temple Dawn uh, Mountain. Center. Dawn, Dawn Mountain. Mountain Meditation Center. Yes. Uh, in Houston, Texas. Um, Dr. Aronson is a psychotherapist who's been practicing for over 30 years now. He is also, um, I, I believe he founded this center. With my wife. With his wife. So we want to hear a bit about his spiritual journey and how he relates spirituality to his everyday life. So without further ado, Dr. Aronson, I would love to hear what your role is here at the center, uh, what you do for, uh, as a professional also, how long you've been practicing, um, what you specialize in. Uh, you also asked about the the journey. Journey, yeah. So where do you want to start? What's number wherever one? You, wherever you would like to start. Wherever you would like to start. Okay. Um, we'll start with the journey. Um, how much it can go on for a long time. <laughs> um, In 1974, I was a chemistry major in Brooklyn College, and the then Richard Alpert was coming to Brooklyn College to give a talk on cognitive psychology, LSD, and oriental mysticism. And I had a little bit of interest in all of those. None of those was very, very popular or known at that time. Yeah. Uh, LSD research was very, very just starting, and he was in fact one of the people who started that research. Um, there was very, very little known on Asian uh, meditation practice, and uh, cognitive psychology was firmly established, but I was curious. And uh, the things that he talked about that most, in a way, shocked me was um, he talked about freedom and um, talked about imprinting and he talked about geese imprinting on whoever led the pack and that humans were in a sense like geese. Followers. Yes, <laughs> and that we could in fact become free uh, in many ways uh, through cognitive psychology, LSD or meditation. And he also talked about universal love 
And the impact was extraordinarily profound. I felt that here was a person who was talking about something that I'd always wanted to hear about, but I hadn't even known that I wanted to hear about it. And um, I was very, very moved and very, very, I mean, I was feeling pins and needles. I was kind of shocked. And um, after that talk, I just felt this is what I really want to study. Um, this is what I really want to find out about. And so in those days, there was very, very little available in New York. Um, I did a little bit of studying with uh, the secretary of Kurjeev, his name was Mr. Anderson, for about a year, year and a half. And then I applied to graduate school. I wasn't sure if I was going to study Hinduism or Buddhism, but it ended up to be Buddhism. And uh, just to make it a little bit short and quick, ended up in India in 1971, supposed to be writing a thesis on Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, ended up doing a lot of Theravada meditation with uh, Sri Satyanarayan Goenka. Um, subsequently, I wrote a thesis on love, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity in Theravada Buddhism, and um, spent probably about eight years teaching at University of Virginia. Um, teaching Theravada Buddhism. And then along the way, I uh, got, I was always a bit involved with Tibetan Buddhism and then got more involved in Tibetan Buddhism in about 1974. And um, that became a burgeoning interest and involvement. And so I was teaching Pali and Sanskrit and Theravada Buddhism, but also being more and more involved with Tibetan Buddhism. and. Um, that went through about 1982. I didn't get tenure and I had to retool and um, in the middle of things in about 1977 I had started having panic attacks and which was kind of surprising to me because I thought meditation was supposed to take care of everything and um, got into some psychotherapy and I was in a way shocked again by what I didn't know about myself psychologically and what started becoming clear in the process of psychotherapy. Were you, were you practicing at this point? You were, you were, you were practicing? Are you, would practicing you consider, what? Would you have considered yourself a practicing Tibet, Tibetan Buddhist? Uh, at that point I was practicing Tibetan okay. Buddhism, okay. yeah. And so when I didn't get tenure, I needed to figure out what I was going to do with myself, which took quite a long time. Um, and I decided to become a therapist. And um, there are many people who are like Tibetan Buddhists and there are many people who are therapists, but there are not that many people who actually know Tibetan and Sanskrit and Pali and who actually also know what it means to be a psychotherapist. There are a few. Um, so I became a therapist. Uh, we did move to Houston and in about 1970, 1996, we started doing some teaching. And founded Dawn Mountain. And what we do is a little bit unique. We actually, we teach things like mindfulness and simple meditation, but we also have uh, ourselves are ordained as lamas in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And so we teach uh, Tibetan Buddhist practice that's very, very uh, close to the lineage and is in the, what's called the Dzogchen lineage of Tibetan Buddhist practice. And it's a uh, very, very specific uh, lineage practices of Tibetan Buddhism. And at the same time, on, we do that mostly in our retreats. On Tuesday nights, we 
first and third Tuesdays we have lectures which are introductory to Tibetan Buddhism, um, but they're related to very specific traditional Tibetan Buddhist teachings, but we try to make them accessible and digestible to modern Western audiences. And the thing that my wife and I are particularly sensitive to is the fact that, you know, Tibetan Buddhist practice is, what, coming from 13,000 miles away and in many ways a thousand years older culture, yeah. traditional practice, and in translating traditional practice into modern situation, there's a lot of um, consideration that has to be given to how to do that and work most effectively uh, with modern students. So we're very, very sensitive to the psychological issues and spiritual practice. And we're also presenting very, very high order uh, spiritual information that's not that widely available. I, th I think it's really interesting because many of these Tibetan Buddhist transcendental meditative practices that have come over uh, from John Kabat-Zinn, he was a, he was a, he was a big he was a really big proprietor who brought that over. Have been adopted into many of these psychological interventions that right. therapists use nowadays right. as a way to treat anxiety, treat depression, right. and also as a way to enable well-being. So right. I would love to hear you being on the forefront of this for the past thirty years. What the shift you've seen coming off nineteen seventy to the present in bridging that gap, uh, bridge between psychotherapy and meditation and Buddhist practices. <laughs> it's probably been a, a huge shift. <laughs> well, when I started, if you had said that you wanted to incorporate, you, f you even wanted to mention Buddhism either as a patient or as a therapist, basically <laughs> people would have gone that. Um, and nowadays, I don't know that you can find a book written on any subject in psychotherapy without mindfulness without being yeah. mentioned. Um, a reality is, is that mindfulness is a very, very useful intervention and it's not a cure-all. Yeah. And a lot of people kind of see it as that and certainly, you know, Goenka, to quote him, said, take care of your meditation and your meditation will take care of you. And unfortunately, that's just not the case. And I know that personally, and I know that from people who are involved in the meditation world. So while mindfulness and meditation are extraordinarily useful, and they're useful both for helping self-regulation develop and they're useful for self-reflection. Um, mindfulness typically, as taught traditionally, was not a relational practice. Yeah. Most people's psychological issues are relational in origin. And they need that social component to develop. They are, well, they, they grew out of a social dysfunction and to be healed Typically, I think, optimally, it's done in a relationship with a psychotherapist. Okay. And the issues that are addressed in psychotherapy, modern psychotherapy, are not actually addressed in the traditional literature, are not known in traditional practice. The biggest, I think, core issue is, uh, to condense it down to really the core issue, uh, people, have a lot of defenses, and we need defenses, and these are mm, ways of protecting ourselves from either overwhelming external or internal uh, events, typically emotional events. And so defenses are good, but most people come into adulthood with mm, defenses that are ossified, calcified, and pretty much overdeveloped. And their defenses get them into a lot of trouble. And you're not typically gonna get to work on your defenses if you're practicing mindfulness alone. It really requires somebody to 
work with you in a loving, compassionate, sympathetic way to allow you to understand, to see them in operation and to perhaps relax them a bit and understand where they originally came from and how they're interfering with your life. Do you, do you feel that some of these mindfulness practices that, as you say, have been secularized and they've kind of lost that tradition due to the fact that you know we live in a secular country and many of these uh, practices may not be reflective of people who practice other faiths. Do you think that bringing a component of spirituality back into these mindful interventions, back into these practices, can help uh, impact these in individuals in a, in, a, in a more holistic manner? Well, you would have to define for me what spiritual means. And, you know, I probably would be totally happy to say that mindfulness is an access to spiritual reality and spiritual reality is much vaster than what is currently being taught in the mindfulness world and I mean you may not be aware of this and I have a book called Buddhist Practice on oh, Western yeah. Ground We'll put, the, I, we'll put the link down in the description. <laughs> and I talk about this quite specifically, but the purpose of mindfulness as it's now incorporated in the mental health environment yes. is completely different from the purpose of mindfulness as it was originally, originally yeah. um, yeah. taught in Buddhist practice. And that's fine. It's just Buddhist practice was oriented for lessening involvement with worldly matters and seeking some kind of freedom from worldly entanglement. And that can look a lot of different ways. You know, in Theravada Buddhism, it looks one way. In Tibetan Buddhism, it looks another way. In China, it looks another way. In Zen and Korea, it looks another way. Very, very different. The embodiment of Tibetan Buddhist, of Buddhist practice can look so different in various cultures. But almost all of the Buddhist cultures would agree that just being an ordinary person and being totally involved with worldly activities is probably not ideal yeah. and it gets you into trouble. Um, mindfulness in the West to a large extent is meant to improve worldly life in brief. Yeah. And so you can be a more successful businessman, student, doctor, lawyer, whatever. Uh, that's not what it was originally taught it's an, for. It's supposed to be an access point to the cosmic truth within, within one's It own. certainly is meant to open one to understanding the nature of reality. To, to break Maya, that, 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 illusion, that, that, that illusion. To break illusions, yeah. yes, yes. So it's great. I think that people who practice mindfulness may like it or not, end up being more spiritual, meaning they may be more sensitive to themselves, more sensitive to others, more loving of themselves, more loving of others. But typically they're not looking for, whether it be in Theravada language, Nibbana, or Buddha nature in Tibetan Buddhist practice, or, you know, that's not what they're looking for. And that's what it was originally meant to arrive at. I would, I would, I would love to hear from you what spirituality means to you in your practices? Well, I think it's a broad continuum and I think in general spirituality, just in general, it's speaking about humans' relationship to something that typically transcends ordinary consciousness, ordinary relationship, ordinary reality. Uh, sometimes it's a reality described as beyond space and time, but not necessarily always. Um, but there is some relationships to, to use a big word, something ontological that is other than uh, the everyday world. And you know, in the theistic religions, that ontological other is God. So God is 
different from human and the spiritual there is a relationship between human and God who exists in some kind of mysterious ontological manner. In Theravada Buddhism, maybe the ontological other is Nibbana. In Tibetan Buddhism, it would be something like Buddha nature. But it's something that's really of another order that perhaps gets integrated or in some sort of relationship in your ordinary life. But to begin with, it's something that's truly different from ordinary worldly life, yes. which if as a beacon or if touched is going to both enhance your wisdom, be a fruition of wisdom and result in wisdom, and will also typically enhance things like compassion and fellow feeling for other human beings. And maybe the last thing you can say, say to our viewers who are watching is, what's a, an application that they can take from your experiences and your practices into engaging more holistically, into increasing compassion to their life, maybe finding that Buddha nature? Well, uh, I don't have a quick way to find your Buddha nature, but... <laughs> the diamond vehicle, right? That's what, you, well, that's what they call the, the Theravada tradition. Uh, Theravada is not, doesn't actually use the word, the Tibetan Buddhists will Tibetan use it, Buddhist. diamond. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one of the most profound practices out of the Tibetan Buddhist uh, practice, and many people have heard of it, it's called Donglen, it's sending and, and giving, uh, taking and sending. But the main idea of it is, uh, one, and this does in a way work with the whole issue of denial, if we're feeling some suffering, to actually come in contact with our own experience. Most people in the West do not want to feel anything, and they certainly don't want to feel suffering. Yeah. There is a cultural preference for happiness if you read cross-cultural psychology, which is very, very interesting, and I mentioned this in my book, uh, there's some very, very interesting uh, things that we do in America by way of expectations of happiness and discussing happiness and looking for happiness in one another. That it's not, it's not done in other cultures. It's not shared in other cultures. Um, so one is can we actually just know what we're feeling in our bodies? That's actually a big practice in and of itself. Most people don't want to do it, don't know how to do it, don't know how to access that. So that may take some, might take some therapy, might take some body work, may take some attention. Um, a very, very simple practice is if I'm feeling suffering, just to recognize all other beings feel this very, very same suffering. And so that's conducive to empathy. So right there, I mean, if you can do that simple practice, it's terrific. The actual taking and sending is, I'm feeling, let's say, this particular kind of suffering. Um, to make an aspiration, may I take on all similar suffering of all sentient beings into my suffering? And if you do that, and then to breathe out love slowly to all other beings. But there are steps to that, and there are, you know, there's writings on the web, and there are books about Donglen, taking and sending. Um, but that aspiration of using one's own suffering as a sort of benchmark of, God, I'm suffering, may I remove all being suffering into my own, and then there's some opening to love, sending out love. You can do it with the breath. It's a very profound and it's, um, it can have enormously deep uh, layers to it in terms of even understanding something like selflessness. But it's also very, very uh, significant in terms of uh, developing compassion for self and others. Yeah, I think Viktor Frankl had this book, Man's Search for Meaning. Right. And kind of that thesis that he drew from his experience as being a Auschwitz um, survivor was that suffering was the most profound um, intuition and feeling and intangible momentary type of 
bliss in a way that a human can go through because it it captures meaning and 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 transcendence into a person's life because they can they can find meaning in that suffering if you can, can and if you if can work can. with it yeah yes and some people can't work with it and they're let's say people with certain kinds of traumas nowadays um don't have the psychological structure to contain being able to work with suffering and so for them it might not work and so one of the reasons you want to be aware and you know one of the reasons i appreciate being trained as a therapist is that no one size spiritual intervention is going to fit so. all individuals yeah. and for some people who are subject to let's say fragmentation or disintegration or uh disorganized attachment um even simple spiritual practices like the one i just described you wouldn't want them to try even because it would be overwhelming yeah and so we need to be very very sensitive to what we teach and offer and kind and sympathetic to ourselves and kind and sympathetic to others and i'll add in the west uh i think the biggest spiritual challenge for almost all western practitioners is self-hatred and self-criticism which i call kind of the common cold of spiritual life mm -hmm. also psychological life and it's built in to the extent that you feel that there may be something better available whether it be psychologically or spiritually then it almost comes with the territory that you start hating yourself for where you are it's it's almost built in and so really one of the things we try to pay attention to is the way people absorb spiritual information because it's so easy to turn it against the self and start criticizing oneself and start hating oneself i'm not meditating enough i'm not meditating well enough i'm not there you're there other people are there my life is miserable it it can just become why uh, haven't i reached enlightenment yet yeah so it 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 can become its own kind of problem and it's a big big issue it's not a small issue and so in the west um when we teach we certainly pay a lot of attention to that because it's um you know i think in asia in some ways people believe very very naturally in many many lifetimes and they feel well you know i'll do what i can in this lifetime and yeah, i'll do it and and it's expected and maybe they run into some of those issues but i don't think it has quite the same dynamism that it has in in the modern west where people get very very uh self-critical about their involvement with spirituality or even psychological development i think uh, i think a very simple thing to do is breathing techniques and just kind of regulate and try to defeat these self-defeating type of thoughts if that, that can uh, work if that can work and but you know the power power of psychotherapy It really you is. know it turns out that that kind of especially when there's been trauma and a lot of in, internalized negativity it's it's a lot of work yeah it is a lot it's of not work. it's not necessarily that simple and and you know a lot of stuff is thrown out that is meant to address this and some of it probably does but a lot of the kind of deeper injuries that people have experienced at the hands of frankly abusive parents requires a lot of time and trust building um where people have really been traumatized when we're kind to them they actually experience it as almost invasive harmfulness yeah. and that's not necessarily the broad swath of population but I think it's very very important to be aware that um there are many people out there who can't won't don't benefit from what can be beneficial to many many people like is the simple practice of mindfulness which I want to support you in what you're doing and 
the fact that you're exploring it for kids and schools, it's great. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope people who need more will also well, yeah. get more. That's, that's usually why we introduce it as a tier one, as kind of a measure across the board. And then kids who are not reacting well to it, those kids have red flags that we can then kind of intervene in a, in, in a more comprehensive manner. Um, if, if you can and if you do, there thank you, you. There you go. But the, a reality is I know there aren't that many there services aren't. available, yeah. especially in, schools, yeah. in some settings. Lots of schools. I want to thank Dr. Aronson for being part of today's episode. Um, if people wanted to reach, to reach the Dawn Meditation Center, is there a website that they can go Dawn to? Mountain. DonMountain.org. 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 Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Dr. Aronson. Thank you. Subscribe and support, um, and I look forward to meditating at the center. Okay. It's one of the things with this channel is just finding different places to engage more fully with my spirituality. Great. And finding the nature within all of us. Thank yeah. you, guys.